work with a school called DubSpot that's based in New York. I'm an instructor as well as a course designer. I'm a certified trainer of Ableton Live. The main purpose of my lecture and demonstration today is to talk about how MIDI controllers are not just controllers, they can also be used as instruments. And for uh, the modern electronic musician today, uh, this is, you know, a really powerful way for us to express ourselves, um, but it's also an easy crutch if you just let, you know, the controllers do all the work and don't actually utilize them as, you know, instruments. So I'm going to show you a few different ways how I use these uh, controllers that I have in front of me. This is the Novation Launchpad. Uh, this happens to be a custom edition that was gold, and I just used it so much that the gold all rubbed off. So you can see I have been getting some good use out of it. But uh, this controller is really special because it's uh, one of the first controllers that was made to be plug and play with Ableton Live. Meaning that as soon as you plug it in, uh, there's a screen uh, called the session view, which is right here where we're looking at in live. And there's a button on the launch pad that mirrors the session view. So when I have clips that are loaded in there, I can see those clips here. If I want to play something, I can hit my button. And right now, those are all set to play. So all these buttons that correspond to those clips are green. If I hit these buttons below, that means that I've stopped all those clips, and now you can see those buttons have turned this amber color. If something's going to record, then it'll turn red. So the launch pad is nice because it's a good visual extension of the software that I'm using. But there's other modes that allow me to do a lot more than just look at what's on my screen. Okay? Uh, there's a mixer section, which is really helpful if I'm using this in tandem with something else. Because in that way, I can see my tracks that are available, uh, and then I can uh, either arm them. There's an arm button down here. So if I'm looking at track one, track two, track three. So I can arm those, I can solo them, and I can do all of that from this controller so I don't have to go back and touch my computer when I want to record something. Okay? In addition to that, there's a mode here called user one mode, and this sends MIDI note data. So this is probably the most, um, what I use the most when I'm creating, okay? Um, the reason why MIDI note data is important, obviously, is because those notes that you send to different instruments are gonna allow you to play them out. And then what I've been using main, mainly for my live shows is this, uh, it's the QNEO. This is a controller made by Keith McMillan. Uh, this is probably the most flexible out of the controllers that I have here, the best combination of features. Um, the launch pad and the MIDI Fighter 3D, neither one of those are velocity sensitive. So what that means is that if I want to play a more nuanced performance, say if I have a synth or something and I want to play a pattern out, um, all the notes are going to be at the same exact volume, okay, if I use this or I use this. So the cool thing with the QNEO, again, the buttons are velocity sensitive, and each pad here uh, can send a different message in the corners. So not only can you send one message just by hitting it in the center, but each corner can send a different CC message or a MIDI note message. Uh, it also recognizes pressure and location. So you have a ton of different ways to map this and manipulate it, okay? Down here, we have this strip for a crossfader, but you can also use it with two fingers and then pinch or, you know, expand your fingers like that, and then that sends a different message, okay? In addition to all that, uh, there's the whole element of light feedback. All of these controllers light up, and, you know, I think that's also a very cool thing for people to see as well. You know, you press a button, it lights up, or you can do custom light feedback to correspond with your show. And it's just another element that kind of adds, uh, you know, makes you feel like you're actually doing something and not just sitting there pressing buttons or looking at Facebook while, you know, your, your set's playing. So let me just give you a couple different examples of how I use this stuff, okay? So right here, uh, I have a patch here called Pad Morphing Glass. Let's see, so if I go to my launch pad, uh, like I said, there's different modes here. So if I go into the user one mode, this is sending MIDI note data, okay? So now, I can play that pad sound, okay? Now again, it's sending full velocity, okay? Every note I play is gonna be at full velocity. So again, if that's an issue, then I would wanna use a different controller, okay? Which, if I wanted to, I could use the QNEO. And for the sake of, let's just hook it up. My uh, USB hub, was, uh, was not strong enough to handle all these devices, so I gotta swap them in and out, so. We will take out the launch pad, bring in the QNEO, and all of its glory. So the QNEO has a bunch of different uh, scripts that are made for certain programs, okay? There's a script that's made for Ableton, uh, there's a script that's made for Tractor and Serato and different stuff like that. Uh, I personally don't generally use a lot of those scripts. I like to just kind of mini map stuff myself. If I go to this first mode here, each button, 
each pad, I should say, is sending one uh, MIDI note message, okay? Now, if I go to a different mode, when it's called grid mode, each corner is gonna send a different MIDI note message, okay? So instead of having access to 16 notes, I've got 64 notes, okay? And it is velocity sensitive. The only thing is that the buttons aren't really that, uh, there's not a whole lot of give. So it's kind of hard to like, it's not like playing a keyboard, I'll just basically put it that way. But there is velocity sensitivity, okay? So not something I'm really worried about right now. I use the uh, QNEO mainly because of the touch strips and the crossfader, which is something that neither one of these have. And that's something that I'll get to after, you know, I lay down another pattern and start messing around with this. So let's bring the launch pad back in. So what I wanna do is I wanna play a pattern to go along with my drums, okay? And let me see, I think this might actually be a bit too subdued for my taste. So let's go for something, uh, let's see. Actually, you know what? Screw a pad, let's go for a lead. A nasty lead. Um, let me see, how about? Uh, yeah. Okay. I'm bring this down a bit. Okay. So I'm going to record a pattern here. Um, and uh, yeah, <laughs> let's see. Okay. So the first two bars weren't quite right, so I'm just going to change the loop length. Stretch out this last note. And let me see, this is not quite on. There we go, okay. So now at this point, what I generally like to do is I really enjoy using, you know, the same pattern with different instruments and being able to make something that's pretty simple sound very full and very fat and almost like a wall of sound, okay? With live, it's really easy for me to do that because what I could do is have the MIDI from this clip being fed into another MIDI track with a different instrument, okay? And that's what I'm gonna do. I have another instance of my operator synth, okay, right here. And this has a patch on it that I like quite a bit. Let's get rid of this filter. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna have the MIDI from, the MIDI's gonna come from this track here, okay? So then I don't have to play anything else. Let's see, MIDI from track five or a monitor to end, okay? Now right now you can see there's level coming from there, but I got that track muted, okay? Okay. So now they're both playing the same pattern, but what I wanna do, using my MIDI effects, I can control uh, how the MIDI is received into this track before it actually hits the MIDI instrument, okay? So maybe I don't want that patch to play uh, you know, in the same octave as the other one, okay? Maybe I want this to play a couple octaves below. If that's the case, I can go into my MIDI effects here, and let me see, if I go to my pitch MIDI effect, I can drop that before the instrument, bring this down an octave, okay? So now you hear the difference there. If I wanted to, maybe I could bring in an arpeggiator, We'll bring this in after the pitch effect. So now that I have that stuff there, it'd be really cool to be able to manipulate these MIDI effects in real time without touching the computer, okay? Because if I'm able to manipulate the timing of this arpeggiator, either by changing the rate, it's gonna add something totally different to the performance, okay? 
Uh, if I'm able to increase the gate time, that's also gonna add something totally different to the performance. If I increase the amount of steps, So even though I've already played the MIDI performance, by manipulating the MIDI effects, I can add a lot more to the performance where it feels like I'm actually really playing something. I'm adding different parts, I'm you know, changing this. So, and with the Q-Neo, I can take advantage of the fact that I have sliders and faders and you know, these little rotary buttons and stuff as well, okay? So what I think I'd like to do is, let's MIDI map this. The rate right here of the arpeggiator, I'm gonna map that to one of my sliders. There we go, okay. And let me see, I'm gonna change this because I don't wanna go that crazy with it. So maybe between 16th notes and quarter note triplets. Yeah, that'll work. All right, so let's see. Okay. Now what's cool about the Q-Neo is that, again, you're not using an actual fader, you're using this touch strip. So I can just touch at an approximate location where I know a certain setting is at, okay? And then I can also still slide to get that smooth interpolation between values, okay? So that's just one thing. All right, so I've got that mapped here. Let's. Go back into our MIDI mapping, okay? The gate, which is basically how um, short the notes are gonna be, okay? I'm gonna map that to this fader here. And yeah, 1% to, let's say 100 and maybe 20. Should be fine. 130, that'll work. So that's going on and that's all receiving MIDI from this clip in track five. Okay. So I can still manipulate this clip in track six, or the instrument in track six, without changing anything from this pattern in track five, okay? Okay. This is still not really using uh, either controller necessarily as, you know, a typical traditional instrument, okay? Now, if I wanted to take that approach, I could. I could set up a MIDI track, with you know a bass uh, or you know some sort of synth or something or with drums and have one controller dedicated to playing stuff live and another one dedicated to triggering effects. Uh, I mean that's something I've been thinking about going forward with some of my new show sets. You know, um, but it's just the thing is is that you have a ton of control over your DAW if you just kind of think outside the box in terms of what controllers you want to use in order to get the most out of a performance. You know, um, there's a, the APC40 which is a controller that's really popular and one that I had for a while. Uh, but for me, it just didn't work because it's just too bulky. It's too big, you know? And I like to be able to pick up my controllers and, you know, step away from my computer and, you know, really manipulate it and use it like I'm actually playing something. You know, to me, it's a lot more powerful than sitting behind your laptop. And it might just be a psychological thing, but um, I've gotten compliments and, like, comments on that all the time. You know, I've never seen someone actually play the launch pad, actually play the Q-Neo. I'll put it to you this way. You know, most of the work that goes into making it feel and seem like you're playing this stuff is work that's done at home. You know, it's work done in the studio, working on tracks, getting certain kits together, working on certain patches. You're typically not gonna build a patch from scratch live on stage and then start MIDI mapping it. And then, you know, most of that is prep work, you know? So if you have an idea of what you wanna accomplish, what you wanna present to your audience, and you just take the time to like map certain stuff. So then when you get on stage, you can trigger what you need to trigger and then really focus on actually playing. To me, that's really what it's about. Welcome to DubSpot. We believe in providing you hands-on experience right away. Whether you're completely new to music and want to turn the sounds in your head into a musical reality, or you're an experienced artist looking to refine your skills and add new tools to your arsenal, we're ready to meet you at your level. For students of all ages, all levels, and all styles of music, DubSpot is here to help you achieve your goals. With course offerings both online wherever you are and at our school in the heart of New York City, we are ready to guide you through the next phase of your musical transformation. 
Whether you want to produce music, DJ, or do both, you've come to the right place. Come explore DoveSpot for yourself. Become a part of our community and make music.